Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Four Checking TV. I'm your host, Doug Gladke, and alongside me are my co hosts, Scotty Porterfield and Trevin TK Catellis. Guys, how are we doing this evening? I'm good. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here, Doug. It's uh, it's uh, fall is in full swing now. I can say as we're uh, we got run our fall ball season down here at Waynesburg, and it's uh, bone chilling cold pretty much every day we're practicing. So, uh, but yeah, it's good weather and uh, we're enjoying it. What's up with these little teases of weather? I know this isn't hockey related, but these little these little days where it teases us, it goes up to like seventy two degrees, and then the next day drops down to like forty nine. <laughs> Yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal. But let me tell you guys, I mean, you know, any human being of my size and stature loves days where you can get away with both a hoodie and jeans um, yeah. <laughs> and not be completely just sweating your ass off. So it's a very positive thing for me in my life right now is that I'm able to just wear a hoodie and jeans and not be sweating like crazy. So but anyway, um, all that aside, we have a lot to get into. Um, the Chicago Blackhawks finally that that investigation finally concluded, and um, my goodness, um, it's crazy. But um, you know, before we fully get into that, um, you know, it's just it's, there's just so much that's happened, like with that. Um, Obviously, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but before we started recording, um, the player that's been referred to throughout this entire investigation is John Doe One, came out and revealed his identity um, in in an interview with TSN's Rick Westhead. Um, But, you know, what what a bombshell um, for that got dropped on us yesterday. Uh, Stan Bowman stepped down. Uh, as both the head coach or as both the uh, GM of the Blackhawks and of Team USA. I want to just say shame on both those organizations for giving him the opportunity to step down. They should have fired him outright. And um, the truth is Stan Bowman shouldn't have even been doing his job throughout the summer, throughout the entire process of this investigation. Um, You know, and all eyes are on the NHL at this point for what they're going to do with coach Quen, coach John Quenville, who's currently the head coach of the Florida Panthers and is actually coaching right now um, against the Bruins, which is just absolutely asinine to me. And then Kevin shovel day off as well. Who's the current GM of the Winnipeg jets. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen with them, but they both have hearings with the commissioner Um this week or early next week sometime. So I'm sure that this is not the last that we're going to be hearing of this. Um, but yeah, honestly, it's just insane. Scotty, we'll start with you. What are your thoughts on this entire situation? So for those who uh, don't know yet, if you even don't know by the time this episode's uploaded, uh, John Doe has been is uh, revealed to be uh, – was a player to Kyle Beach, who's a uh, former first round pick of Chicago back in 2008. And he basically did, like Dougie said, did an interview with uh, Rick Westhead over at TSN, basically not, not exactly a tell all, but gave uh, a lot of detail about, uh, you know, his time in, in Chicago and, and what happened, obviously that led to what the NHL is dealing with today. And uh, it's sad, man. It really is. It's it, like if I had just I've watched that interview beginning to end, and I've it, it's heartbreaking to see. It really is. You see a guy who just got broke, just broken down. Honestly, he was let down by not just his team, but by the league, his teammates, the organization, everybody. I mean that 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 guy. One of the one of the themes of his interview was just how lonely he was and how lonely he felt. And honestly, how can you blame that guy? I, I mean, I'd be lonely too if I was in his position. It just seemed like no one, no one really cared, and he was cast aside. And, you know, we've already I've gone into my diatribe about uh, about that whole about the situation before back in uh, whenever the news first broke. Whenever we had when we were talking with Dwayne uh, a few months back, and uh, I was pissed about it then. I'm pissed about it now. You know, it's it's yeah. a good thing the Blackhawks finally, you know, stepped up and did what they were supposed to do. But this shouldn't have, this shouldn't have taken this long. It shouldn't have taken, you know, we're talking like, I mean, Doug, like you said earlier, you know, how it 
how he should have been able to do his job during the summer. No, he should have, this should have been handled a long time ago. This goes way beyond just, you know, accountability through ma management or the coaches or the players. It involves everybody. You know, I, I'm, I'm not buying – everybody knew. We, we've said – we know this already. Everybody knew. We, Brent Sopel and Nick Boyton were two guys who stepped up and said that everybody knew. So if anyone who denies at this point, I'm sorry, I don't believe you. Actually, I'm not sorry, but I, I just – I don't believe them. I have no yeah. reason to believe them. And building off of that, you look at uh, – I saw a quote that Alex DeBrink had said about how he was embarrassed by the organization and whatnot. It was something along those lines. Alex DeBrinkett wasn't even on the Blackhawks in 2010. I think he was our age. I think he was like 10 or 11 years old. So he was what 12 years old. And what does that he, mean? Yeah. He, he, like, I'm sorry for hijacking here, but Alex DeBrinkett was 12 years old at the time that this happened. And what he did in a quote, handled the entire situation better than those that were present in the organization when it was occurring handled it and yeah, exactly it's just in, it's insane you know and i'll be honest with you like i said this in a tweet earlier there was a lot of due there's been a lot of due cause recently for jeremy colleton's job to be in question but his his words on the firing of stan bowman alone should be the nail in the coffin and should cost him his job um you know he just went into like an entire soapbox of how like that's just not the stan i know or whatever like i understand that stan bowman is the person who gave you your opportunity in hockey to be a head coach but like be a better person like you know and i mean same goes for the leadership core that's been in chicago for years like be better people don't be cowards like I mean, come on. I mean, the fact that, you know, the fact that they didn't even interview Duncan Keith is insane to me. Um, the fact that Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane both knew about the situation, I would imagine. I mean, everyone knew about the situation from what it seems. Yeah. And the fact that nobody did anything about it, especially somebody the caliber of a Kane or a Taves. I mean, all we've heard for years is just this senseless garbage about how they're all great leaders well they all look like fucking cowards right now mm -hmm. exactly yeah that's honestly the truth Dougie. i mean everyone wants to talk about how you know yeah like you said about how great of a leader these guys are and everything but and then they try and come up with an excuse like oh well he was a john and taze was a young captain i don't care like at the end of the day this is not like some situation where okay you know where you are like kyle beach where you are a rookie and maybe you are uncomfortable with stepping up and saying something. There are veteran players in that locker room. Like there were guys in their 20s and 30s that were in that locker room that knew what was going on, that knew that this wasn't right. And instead of prioritizing, you know, how someone, you know, what someone needed, they prioritized what a hockey team needed. You know, they prioritized putting the team's success over somebody's own feelings and somebody who needed help. And that's just, it, it's garbage. It's sickening. And it's not even somebody's own feelings, somebody's own safety. Yeah, that, that's the better word to put it. But you're right, Dougie. That's the better way to phrase it. My fault on that. But regardless, it, it's just, it, it's tough. I, it, it just, it, you can't have stuff like this going on and stuff like this can't continue to happen. Especially considering the fact that, you know, you see just how, like I said, if you, if anybody, if you are, for our viewers, if you get a chance to watch this interview, please do, because you'll see just how badly this, how broken this guy is. I mean, he's, he's tearing up the entire time. You can tell that it still affects him to this day. I, he's been carrying this baggage for 11 years, essentially. So to see him, you know, finally just essentially let it all out now, it's, uh, man, it's heartbreaking. It really is. And I, I feel bad for Kyle Beach. I feel bad for anybody who's had to deal with this because this isn't, a situation that should ever have a blind eye turned to it, no matter what, what it, no matter what the case is, whether it's part of a team or whether you're just an individual living your own life and something this happens, it's, no one should ever turn a blind eye to this type of stuff. And there needs you to know. be more accountability. Like I'm, I, like you said earlier too, Dougie, the fact that Joel Quinville is behind the bench coaching an NHL team tonight is like, it's sickening. That guy has no business being there. That guy should just be 
getting ready to go to retirement because I, I mean, if he still has a job by the end of this, that's a huge drop of the ball by the NHL. I don't care what the guy's done and what he's accomplished. It means nothing to me with how he's handled this situation. The saddest thing about this is the Blackhawks failure to um, follow through and do the right thing allowed a 16 year old to get sexually assaulted by, by this guy. Um, I'm not even going to say his name. He doesn't even deserve the satisfaction of us saying his name at this point. Um, you know, the fact that they just let him walk around and just continue to just live his life and do what he does caused a 22 year old intern to be sexually assaulted. Another player that did not come through and did not feel comfortable enough to follow through with the investigation. And then he, you know, I mean, the, the most insane thing for me of, of it all is they let him take the Stanley Cup to a high school with kids. Yeah. I didn't even know that. I saw that in Beach's interview. I had no clue that's where he went with it. I didn't know that either. And it, it, no. it like shook me to my core for a good couple minutes there. Like I couldn't believe that they let this guy go around kids again. You know, and then after that, after he left the Blackhawks, they – an organization let him be around kids again. Like the amount of just damage that several people have allowed this guy to cause over the past several years, over the past decade plus, is just insane. It's just, it's devastating. Um, it's so easy to, it yeah. was, it just, it could have been nipped in the bud so easily and it never happened. Yeah, you could have just nipped it 10 years ago. And so much negativity came from it. And it's, yeah. it's all the Blackhawks' fault with how they handled it, 100%. You know, but this is a very important life lesson. There's a very important life lesson in all of this that I feel like needs to be instilled in everybody at a young age, especially athletes. Winning isn't everything, you know? Winning cannot come before being a good human being or, you know, being a good person, being a good husband, being a good father, being a good student athlete, things of that nature. Winning cannot come before that, you know, and when it's at this extreme of a case where the safety of one of your prospects and one of your players and not even that, just like you're basically the protection of one's morals just gets like thrown out the window um, because of this. It's just, it's, a, it's horrible. Um, it's just a horrible, horrible situation. Um, I'm absolutely heartbroken for Kyle beach. Um, I'm just, I'm heartbroken that he's had to go through this. I'm heartbroken for the, other people that ha have been assaulted um you know and not that it's obviously it's separate isolated inc incidents but i'm heartbreaking for a heartbroken for akeem alu as well um where you know that whole thing with went down with bill peters when he was in rockford and again the principle of winning and the principle of success was more important than taking care of your own and taking care of your players and doing what was right what's right you know it's just it's horrible so i don't want to put this out there for you um i saw an article a couple articles about this online as you said obviously mm -hmm. you know the team is more worried about winning than they are um about doing the right thing as an organization or as players individually because any of those players <clears throat> pardon me there could have came out on their own and reported this even if they wanted to go against their team obviously the team wouldn't have appreciated that but you know, those, those players could have did that on their own terms as well. But you have to question the 2010 Cup um, as well as something that at that point that was right after that happened um, for the Chicago Blackhawks and that they were mo more focused on that and heading towards that time than doing the right thing and reporting this issue um, during that whole investigation and whatnot going on. And like you said, head coach for Florida right now, I mean, it's a shame for the Florida Panthers because – the organization they currently have right now is pretty damn good. 
Um, you know, it's a star studded team, you know, they look pretty good under his coaching. Um, and it's a shame it's going to come down to the point where, you know, he has to be removed from that coaching spot. Um, if he's not, as you guys said, that's a shame when you're on, on the NHL and Gary Bettman. Um, but you know, Florida's a good team and it's a shame for them, but again, jumping back, um, I totally agree with that point that Chicago was only focused on winning and nothing else. Yeah. And the big thing is, is if you're a good, if you're a good team, it doesn't matter who's coaching that team. I could be coaching the Panthers right now and they'd be perfectly fine. Um, right. Yeah. But you know, the whole thing is, you know, somebody with the power and the voice that Joel Quenville possessed back in 2010, he could have had that entire thing destroyed in a, in, in an hour, it would have taken but one he, meeting, but and he didn't. the entire thing was done. <laughs> but he didn't exactly. He didn't. Kevin Chevaldeoff didn't. Um, there's so many other people that didn't do it. Um, I know a lot of people are saying, "Oh, Jonathan Taze was a young captain," but you know, I and I'm not saying this to be biased, but I wholeheartedly believe that if this was happening and the roles were reversed, Sidney Crosby would have spoken uh, forward and defended Kyle Beach or, absolutely, you know, someone else of his caliber. I believe that over three, three, uh, three fourths of the captains in the league from the time that Taves was named captain to now would have put an end to this mm. um, without, without a doubt. Um you know, I get the whole like trying to win the cup thing, but like really, again, it doesn't matter. Winning is not the end all be all, especially when we're talking about someone's safety and sanity. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, it's garbage. It's all garbage. Um, the entire Blackhawks organization should be ashamed of themselves. Um, obviously, everybody that's been involved in that that's still in the organization has gone, but still, um, you know, the damage has been done enough. The fact that they let this go on, you know, one day, let alone 11 years, is just absolutely, it's, it's beyond insane. Like I, you, you cannot even believe it, you know? Yeah. It's, it's terrible. And we can't say it enough times to, truly understand understand it i guess but you know one thing that we do need to say is for anybody that's you know been victimized or is a survivor of, of anything that goes on like this you know don't hesitate to reach out for help because it's there there are people there are organizations that are there to help you you know do not do not bury your feelings about this don't don't sit back and and ignore this you know this is something that that people are willing to address and people are willing to care about. I think that's the biggest key. You know, there that it's the Blackhawks may have let Kyle Beach down, but there are people that would have helped. There are people there that would have helped him out. And I feel like that's something that people tend to forget whenever things like this happen. And I think that that's the main thing that needs to be addressed here is that, you know, don't, don't ignore it. Look for help because it'll always be there. Absolutely. Absolutely. TK, is there anything else that you want to add on this? Um, no, on the Blackhawks, I don't think. I mean, we've all kind of said enough um, regarding it. I mean, if you wanted to, if anybody wanted to, as far as the viewers get into looking at it right now, um, there actually is some interviews and some videos regarding the actual attorney and lawyer who processed this whole um, case from Chicago. Um, I watched a little bit of that actually. And the way Chicago kind of told him is, you know, follow where the facts take you. And that's exactly what the attorney did. Um, this, this set attorney actually have his name pulled up just for the uh, purpose of this, but Reed, Reed Shar was his name. Um, he worked for Jenny and block um, out of Chicago. He prosecuted a lot of, you know, corrupt politicians and terrorists in his time. Um, but that was basically his word to, to everyone is Chicago Union told him, follow where the facts take you. And that's exactly what he did in the case. But if you're interested in that part of it, obviously you can read more into it. But um, yeah, like I said, we've, we've pretty much covered as much as we possibly can in Chicago at this point. 
I totally agree. Um, moving forward, um, TK, you said you wanted to recap a little bit of what's going on in the NHL right now. Um, beyond, yeah, for this. sure. So, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the teams. I mean, I'm gonna throw this out to you guys. I'm gonna ask a couple, like a couple questions um, to you guys about some of the teams and what you think. Um, about some things going on. Have you noticed the trend so far? I mean, obviously we're early in the season. You know, there's a lot of games to be played out yet, for sure. But looking at the way things are playing out, do you see the trend of all the teams that haven't been good over the years all of a sudden look like they're good? <laughs> get, yeah. give, me, um, give me Buffalo, for example. I mean, they don't look bad. Um, you're you're couple- Boston and Toronto right now in the standings. What's that? They're above Tampa, Boston, and Toronto in the standings right now. Right, exactly. And, I mean, you're down to the, the final four um, undefeated teams currently. Um, Florida, Edmonton, St. Louis, and Carolina. And, I mean, obviously there's a couple in there that are kind of givens. But, you know, some of those ones up at the top, like San Jose, it's a decent team. Um, but just a couple to touch on. I mean – Let's let's talk first with that expansion team. You know the Seattle Kraken. They are not anything to look forward to right now. If you're a Kraken fan, um, if you're you were looking forward to this team, they are not doing too well. Um, so I mean, what's your guys' take on it? I mean, do you see any way that they're gonna you know, improve coming out here? Or are they gonna keep on the kind of train that they're rolling on? I expected this. Um, in my opinion, I feel like the team was assembled to build it up through the draft. Um, they already have a really good piece prospect wise with Maddie Beneers. And, you know, if you're able to get a top three pick, you know, add maybe a Shane Ryder or Brad Lambert to that mix, they're really cooking with fire in terms of building for their future. Um, you know, because the big thing is, is like they, the younger guys they drafted, they're not going to be franchise players for their team but like they're perfect complementary pieces, you know, like I think of Mason Appleton and Jared McCann. And I see two guys there that are perfectly capable second line or third line forwards for a team that has really good center depth. Um, Yeah. You know, on defense outside of Giordano, they're all younger guys that you take chances on like Vince Dunn, the flurry brothers, players of that nature. Um, You know, they locked Ruby up to that long contract. It reminds me a lot of what the um, Senators did with signing Matt Murray in anticipation that whenever that team's ready to contend, he's going to be the guy in net for them. And he's going to be able to be shut down um, in net for them and take them to where they need to be. Another thing about uh, Seattle is to throw a little salt in the wound for Penn's fans here. I think Brandon Tanner has five goals on the year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he does yeah. kind of going off a little bit so far he's almost at a goal per game right now <laughs> which is unbelievable um i i just i don't understand it you know and part of me thinks to myself like is it just the way that the penguins four fine functions as a whole you know because like part of me wonders like if you put brock mcginn in a top nine role anywhere else what would he do Right. You know, like that had me thinking that at least. Um, Jared McCann looks awesome, though. Um, he does. That breaks my heart, but good for him. Um, I think he's on a career high f- four point four game point streak right now. Like he's just been he's been killing it. Um, so since you're on a topic, Doug, with, um, you know, former Penguins and stuff like that, I want to bring this up to you guys as well. I mean, not that. Not that we're any, anywhere near it. I'm not saying that the Penguins are, you know, a spectacular team at the moment, but they're playing great. They're playing decent, pretty, pretty good hockey for being out as many player, many star players as they're out. You're down Brian Rust. You're out Jeff Carter. You're not playing Chris Letang. Crosby and Malkin are both out, and yet you're still winning some games. You know, Danton Hyde and, and them are playing. You know, up on top lines. And they're getting it done. So it's, it's kind of nice to see some of those guys that you didn't really necessarily expect to be, you know, superstar players, but they're covering for all of them and they're still getting the job done. So I think that's kind of nice to see. 
Yeah, I mean, this stretch of games that they have, they've had up to this point, this would have been something that I would have, you know, just with the way the schedule was to start the year, a 3-1-2 one, and two start would have been something that I would have been celebrating if they had both, even if they had both Crosby and Malkin. Um, you know, Tampa's nothing to sneeze at. It's understandable that they dropped that game last night. Um, I don't think... But, like, even though they lost last night, I don't think Tristan Jari played bad no. um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the only gripe that I had about him was I think he was out a little too deep on the Palat goal. Um, but beyond that, like, I think I think he's been perfectly fine. Whenever you said, TK, whenever you said, speaking of former Penguins, I was absolutely terrified that you were going to say, should they trade for Flurry? And it's like, no. Not right now. Like, as it sits no, right that- now, no. Like, no, <laughs> there's no chance. You think he was retired now? <laughs> oh, 100%. yeah, oh my yeah, he'd be much better of retiring than what he uh chose to do in Chicago. I mean, he is, I mean, if you look at anybody who plays fantasy hockey, I don't think he's, he's had a um game with positive points yet. I think he's been every, every game has been negative totals. He doesn't, um, he's on he doesn't. Sure. yeah, he so, doesn't have a win either. Um, but since you guys time, so. Since you guys mentioned it, um, with Tampa also, you know, two times Stanley Cup champions, they're not playing as they should. You know, I mean, they they have some games that they're winning, yeah, like last night, but you know, they don't look fantastic. They're beatable this year. They're not that like team. Like, okay, you're slaying the dragon. You get you beat them. You're you're something. That's not not that this year. Um, what 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 holes do you guys see in that team that they're missing from? I mean, obviously they lost some players, but I think that's the they same is they're missing yeah. they're missing that third line they had last year. I think yeah. that's them right now. And you don't have the guys like uh or the Blake Coleman's or the Yanni Gords or any of those guys. That's that's what's gonna come back to bite them, I think. And obviously they'll find a you know, if they're the lightning, they'll find a way to finagle a player and, and put them on there and try and make something happen. But right now it's not there. And don't get it tw- and don't get twisted. Obviously, Tampa Bay's not in any trouble. You know, they're, it's three, three, and one. That's not a bad record to have at this point. I think more people are just shocked the fact that they're below Buffalo and Detroit in the standings. But um, yeah, Tampa Bay is going to be fine. The team that I wanted to get into in that uh, in that Atlantic Division is uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs because I know that a lot of uh, fans up north are uh, smashing the panic button. By the way, they're losing two nothing to Chicago right now. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Wow. Know. Period. Really? <laughs> yeah. They're down for Holy that. crap, <laughs> man! What Soccer, is, Chicago. Uh, what, how much longer do you think it takes before the uh, the torches and uh, pitchforks are outside of uh, Air Canada Center waiting if, to pull if, Kyle Dubas and Sheldon Keith out of there? If Chicago wins tonight, yeah, the holy crap, there's the all hell's yeah. gonna break loose. You know, my my thing with the Maple Leafs is, what else can you do? <laughs> like literally, like what else can you do? Um, there's not much else you can do because they're not going to be able to trade one of those core pieces right now. I don't know. What do you mean by what, – what core piece do you think can't be moved? Which they one can't. cannot? No, I'm not saying any of them can't be moved or they're immovable. I just think that it would be hard to facilitate a trade like that right now. Okay. With where with where they're at in the season, that's more okay. of a thing you pull yeah, off in the summer. You know what I mean? Okay, yeah, I get you now. I thought you meant like I say, it's like if someone offered me Austin Matthews, I'm I'm doing whatever. But I can, I can't deal. in terms of which core player it is, Mitch. I'm I'm all I'm all for just catapulting Mitch Marner into the sun at this point. Um, it's it's not it's not even him. It's it's the pressure that he's under. Um, it's it's like the Phil Kessel situation in Toronto on meth. Oh yeah. It's magnified. Um, yes. It's... That's the, the thing about Marner is like, you know, even with obviously there was drama with Phil back in the day, it's nothing compared to this. And I mean, no. oh, Mar- and I, I mean, Phil had it bad, obviously. And I mean, just all you gotta do is look back and see how bad Phil had it. I don't think, I think Mitch is getting it way worse than, than Phil ever did. But the difference between Mitch and Phil is Phil defended himself. 
yeah and mitch is just he's just literally he's a punching bag at this point yes and he just let you know obviously i don't want to speak for him but you can tell he just lets himself get in his own head Mm -hmm. with it rather than just like speak out you know i mean just not to cut you off but just to defend mitch marner a little bit here i know a lot of people are dumping on the guy listen he's not sitting up in his house you know counting his money just it's like i can't believe they're paying me to do nothing like guys got you know as fans you gotta lighten up on the guy a little bit you he doesn't want to be struggling right now no players no no player gets gets the stage where he's at is like yeah whatever i'm just stealing money from these guys at this point he's still young in his career he still wants to be productive he has something to prove he wants to win a stanley cup so the fact that everyone's just dumping on the guy is just unnecessary to me but it's gonna happen at the same time you know when you when you put yourself in that situation that he did and now you're not living up to the expectation that's been set out for you. It's going to be hard for you to, to you know, block all the haters, that, the hate that's coming, because my goodness, there's a lot of it right now. And unfortunately for him, he's at a point now where the only way to shut people up would be to play at an MVP level. And for, for him, that's literally, I think that that's impossible. Um, you know, it's either played an MVP level or win a Stanley Cup. And as it sits right now, both of those are not even quantifiably possible. Um, right. You know, and I, I just, you know, I don't want to blame it on injuries, but Peter Morazic getting hurt this early in the year doesn't help them. Um, I love Jack Campbell, but he's not a guy, in my opinion, that can take on a starter's workload of games. Um you know, when you think about him in like a goaltending class, he's more comparable to like, you know, somebody that you put in a 1A, 1B type tandem. Like he reminds you a lot. He reminds me a lot of Casey DeSmith, actually, where you can trust him over a stretch of 10 or 15 games. But that's not the guy you go into game one of the playoffs um, with as your number one guy. I don't know about that. I, I think Campbell's a little bit better than – I think he deserves better than getting the, the KC to Smith comparison. Okay, I'll, but, I'll go – I'll give him this one. He's like the L.A. John Bernier, Marty Jones type. Mm. Now I'm still giving him better than that. Maybe I, I think he's better than that too, yeah. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just looking too deep into who he played last year because obviously he went on that streak last year, and I get it, the Canadian division was absolute garbage, but – I mean, he doesn't seem like a bad goalie. And, you know, it seems like the, the team does have faith in the guy. So I wouldn't say he's necessarily, you know, maybe a 1A, 1B. Not that that, you know, I think it's just the team around him at this point. I mean, I think the guys in front of him aren't helping him out. Because it's not like, I mean, with the exception of what happened Saturday night in Pittsburgh, obviously, you know, getting thumped 7 to 1 is not exactly a good look <laughs> for a goalie. But at the same time, I don't think he was, you know, bad per se in that game. And I don't think that, he was bad in the loss against Carolina a couple nights ago either, wherever Freddie made his return against the team. But I think there's a little, I think there's, there is some confidence in Campbell that needs to be had. I don't think that, you know, Peter Morazic getting injured is going to, you know, deter the Leafs completely. I just think there's got, like you said, those big guys got to step up, you know, it goes beyond, you know, Marner obviously is the name that's going to get thrown around. Tavares is another one and they don't have any depth scoring right now either. That's been another thing that I've noticed with the teams. They, those, you know, they're not having a lot of help outside of, you know, Jason Spezza is pretty much yeah. the only guy that's contributing for them right now. And that's a problem when Je- Jason Spezza is what pushing 40 at this point mm-hmm. and you're better players. That's not a good sign. Nick Ritchie's terrible. Oh yeah. He's I'm blown away at how horrifically bad that guy has been to start the year. Um, in a square peg and a round hole with him. Yes. Really like do. he does, he, he doesn't fit the way they play at all. He's just okay. literally skating around out there. Um, you know, and my big thing is, is like, if you trade Marner, what are you looking for in return? I think you could get him for a lot less than what most people think. You know, obviously he's going to take some stuff, but I mean, it's you're not going to be like. Obviously you're getting a first rounder. And I'd say you're probably getting uh, – but truth be told, the, the return might be similar to what you got for Phil, if we're being wrong, if we're being honest. I think it would be. 
since we're making the field comparison, we might as well stick with the trade that brought him here to Pittsburgh. Not saying that that's going to happen, obviously. But, I mean, if that was – if you were to move Marner, I'd say throw a first-round pick in there. You're definitely going to give up a prospect and maybe a roster player too, and you go from there. But I don't think that, you know – I mean, I don't think it'll be a King's ransom necessarily for, for Mitch. Not the way he's playing right now. It definitely wouldn't be. I have a crazy take. Let's hear it. If I were them right now, I would offer him to Arizona for Jacob Chikrin, Clayton Keller. Keep in mind, Clayton Keller has been not great. You know, he's one of those guys that I think would need a change of scenery. And obviously, he's played with Austin in the, in the National Development Program. I think he, I think he was the guy who was on the wing with him and uh, Matthew Kachuk most of the time. And um, you know, it's tough. Like, do you think they'd give up their first? Yeah, you have to. There's no way you don't. Yeah, I was going to say, like, they'd have to, and then, like, maybe, like, a coin flip between Lawson Kraus or Barrett Hayden. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. It's That's, that's going to be an interesting one. And, again, I know everyone's – like I said, everyone's dumping on Martyr right now, and it's easy to do that, but still a long way to go. Hopefully he does pull it together because, obviously, you don't want to see – I mean, it's way too early to break up that tandem uh, that Toronto's going on, got going on up there. But uh, I don't know. A lot of fans are uh, pressing the panic button up north. And, uh, yeah. But I think, as it sits right now, I think William Nylander is a greater piece of that core than Marner. Um, you know, when you think of Nylander, he's a dude that ever since he signed that extension, like he's done everything right. He's always played at a high level. He's shown up in the playoffs and, you know, to an extent, like he's had chemistry with whoever they've had to put him with, um, you know, whereas with Mitch, it's like either he plays with Matthews or um, it's over, you know, moving forward though, um, TK, what, what, what do you have to touch on for us? Uh, I wanted to bring up to you guys and, you know, talk about it for a moment that uh, right now we're all looking pretty right about the uh, New York Rangers at the moment. Yeah. They look, they look pretty good. Um, they, 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 they have the pieces together. Um, they're playing great hockey. Um, you know, I mean, that team looks good. The Metropolitan is going to be a little dangerous this year because you have at times where the Flyers even look good. It just depends on the game. Um, but, I mean, looking at that division right now, um, say this was, you know, down the line, I mean, obviously this doesn't include injuries or anything like that that would happen throughout the season, but where could you see it? I mean, who, who could you see truly maybe taking a one seat out of the Metropolitan? I mean, kind of like aside from Carolina, because Carolina's a top team right now, but I'll take Carolina out of the situation – and put the rest of them. Who could you see being the top one out of the out of the rest of them? I still think it's Washington and Pittsburgh's race at this point. Um, I feel like every summer we go into this thing where everybody's just spewing, you know, hit piece after hit piece after each organization saying, oh, this is when the clock's going to strike midnight. This is when everything's going to go to hell. But the reason they do that is just so they that person can say they had it first, you know? Um, yeah. With the Penguins, I mean, you know where I stand with them. I trust Mike Sullivan with my life. Um, the coaching job that he's been able to do with the top three centers out has been insane. Um, you know, they've discovered more pieces than I think they actually know what to do with at this point. Um, you know, the greatest thing that has come out of this entire injury scare is the fact that we know definitively now that Drew Connor is elite and can play at that level that Rust and Sherry played at in 16 and that Jake played at in 17, where he can be that depth piece that takes your team from 
good to great. You know, he's going to be that difference that turns ordinary into extraordinary for the team. And the Capitals, too. I mean, they're always going to be good. Um, the fact that they have two good goaltenders again, they were able to get Vanacek back from the Kraken is huge for them. Um, you know, and I mean, Ovi's not slowing down. You know, OV is closing in on Gretzky's record slowly but surely, and he's going to have that thing broken within a year and a half. Um, yeah. Put it in the night against uh, Detroit. So, that's you know, impress me low key is the fact that OV got off to as hard, a hot of a start as he did so far this year. I don't know why I was surprised by that. I shouldn't be at this point in his whole career, but I was kind of surprised that OV's gotten off to the, such a quick start and how, how well he's done so far in the early going here. And like I said, I said before when we did our preview of the, of, we did it whenever we did our preview episode like two weeks back. Washington's always a great regular season team. You know they've always been that way, and I didn't see any reason why it wasn't going to continue here. Um, one team that I do want to touch upon in, the, in that Metro is the, uh, the Islanders. Not exactly off to the greatest start, uh, three, two, and one. Not bad, but at the same time, you know, definitely not what I expected from a team that I thought was pretend that like, probably could win and up, end up winning the division. So. What do we think is going on there? Let's deal with the Islanders. That play style can't keep up forever, in my opinion. Um, that's just what I think. I mean, it didn't keep up most of the time for Barry Trotz in Washington. Um, he just caught lightning in a bottle in 2018. Um, in my opinion, the Islanders might be the team that misses a spot um, out of this Metro. Um, I think – once Jack Hughes gets back, he's going to drag the Devils to an eight seed, to a seven or an eight seed in the playoffs. And they're going to be one of the teams that make it out as a wild card. That's the, the capability is there for the Devils for sure. Yeah, especially with the pieces they brought in, that's definitely going to be a team that I think everyone's watching. I figured they'd be like a fringe team. I figured that I think they might have needed one more year. But like you said, if the Islanders continue to underplay the way they have, I don't see any reason why they couldn't get in. Yeah, and the big thing for the Islanders has been the goaltending. Like, Ilya Sorokin's been awful. And, you know, with how old Semyon Varlamov is at this point, he needs someone to bounce off of him. And if Sorokin's unable to show up after being handed an extension by Lou Lamarillo, um, that's going to be very problematic for the Islanders going forward if he's not able to get it together. Um, so real quick before we wrap this up the penguins when they when they get fully rocking and rolling what do you guys think like what's what is what's like the state of the union right now what's what, what are you guys thinking do you think they are what I've been telling you they are for this long. It's kind of hard to, you know, believe they have done as well as they have to start out the season. I think um, the thing that's really stood out to me in the early going, like you said, was how well Drew O'Connor's played. I think he's been the, the biggest sleeper. And I mean, there's no reason why he should ever be getting played behind Sam Lafferty. That's that, that shouldn't be happening. anymore. that should be done at this point. Drew O'Connor has been uh a great addition, like you said. If you want to plug him in on a line with Sid or Gino, it's going to be worth it now. It's worth the experiment to see what's going to happen because I think he can pull it off. Um, honestly, I'm just tired of seeing Evan Rodriguez sign of the first line. I think it's uh, it's time that we you know we move on from that, obviously, and hopefully the sooner guys get back, the better. I saw that Sid did skate today, so that's a good sign. And uh, they're saying I'm reading reports that he wants to be available tomorrow night against Calgary. So fingers and toes crossed that happens, but. Um, yeah, I just I'm just waiting to see what Sullivan does with the lineup first because obviously you know, everyone has their speculation on what it's going to look like, but I'm just waiting to see what uh, what Sully has planned for this for this unit right now because I feel like it could be pretty good for us. Yeah, all I, go ahead. Okay. No, all, all I can say for this team is, like I said, you as much talent as you found out of these guys that you, know, you didn't think necessarily would be the superstars. Watch out for when all the superstars do come back and you add them to it that team's going to be a runaway train from what I can see. Yeah. And, you know, the biggest storyline to start the year, in my opinion, was the resurgence of John Marino. Um, if you have that guy rolling 
in a second pairing role. And Latang comes back to form after he's feeling better. Um, good God. Just look out, you know. And in, in terms of the lineup, you know, it's not as much as what it's going to look like when Sid comes back. You need to look at what it's going to look like whenever Sid and Jeff Carter come back. Um, I've read reports that Jeff Carter is going to be ready towards the end of this week and early next and early into next week. So looking at what the lineup could potentially look like whenever both of those guys are in the lineup is going to be more telling because that'll give you a better idea of what it's all going to shake out and look like whenever, you know, in a system where Malkin's healthy as well. Um, you know, um, right now, Evan Rodriguez is on the line with Crosby and Gensel. I'm not saying I fully agree with it, but part of me believes that whenever Carter comes back, O'Connor may end up going up with Sid. Mm. And that's, that's going to be interesting because, you know, Sid likes having guys that carry the puck well in the offensive zone. Uh, from what we've seen so far, Drew can do that. And, you know, I'm just all for just giving Sidney Crosby the young wingers and just letting them light it up. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously Sid has the history of playing well with, with younger guys coming up and he's made it work in the past. I don't see any reason why he couldn't make it work now because obviously O'Connor's showing that potential. And if we could bring back the glory days of Sherry and Rust, and why not? So should be interesting. It's going to be awesome when they're fully healthy, though, because you're going to have Heinen or Simone up there with them. Yeah. And then O'Connor is just going to play with Malkin, and they're just going to, they're going to tear it up together. It's mm -hmm. good. I'm, I can't wait for it. Yeah. So um, anything else that you guys want to add? I'm good. All right, TK, do um, you have anything to say, anything you want to say? I know we haven't really talked about it on here, so. Um, I mean, no, not really. I mean, you know, it's obviously for all the viewers and everything, you know, follow the show, obviously on everywhere, YouTube, you know, everywhere you get your podcast, keep up with these guys, you know, Scotty and Doug, you guys are kicking ass. You're doing a great job. You know, you, you guys are, you know, one of the, one of the best, um, it, it just not, not because I'm part of the show. I'm not, not being biased here. You know, I listen to a lot of different shows and, um, you know, just I, I find you know you find a little bit a little bit of comedy in this one, as well as like you know a lot of factual stuff as well. So for all the fans out there, keep listening. You know, keep enjoying, watch hockey and stuff like that. I'll still be around from time to time with you guys. Um, for the for those of you guys who don't know, this is my last regular on the show. Um, but I'll be around from time to time. You know, if, if by chance Jack Eichel happens to make his appearance at the Colorado Avalanche, you know I'll be right here. Um, but you know, for now with Colorado. Jack Johnson's the issue, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, you know, th thank you guys as always. And, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be around from time to time. So I look forward to seeing you guys. All right, buddy. Good deal. It's been fun doing this with you and, you know, obviously we're all going to keep in touch. I mean, I literally text you and talk to you every day. So absolutely. Yeah. We're going to be just fine. All right, guys, this has been another episode of four checking TV. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at 4 TV. Subscribe to us on YouTube and look for us wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you guys and good night.